Of all the rapidly expanding fields of medicine, blood component therapy must be considered one of the most significant to both the medical profession and to the public at large. It has been said, perhaps unfairly, that some doctors order blood components from their blood bank as if they were buying milk from the local store. But the preparation of the human product is, to say the least, rather more involved than the bovine. In Australia, these processes are carried out by the Commonwealth Serum Laboratories. It's World War II, and CSL works with the Red Cross to identify the blood type of every Australian army recruit. In the bloodiest conflict in human history, this insight could mean the difference between survival or the alternative. But the ability to transfuse wounded servicemen is greatly limited by the difficulty in storing blood. To this end, Edwin Cohn and his team at Harvard focus on a breakthrough in the fractionation of blood. The aim is to isolate albumin, the key protein required to treat hemorrhagic shock, and to supply this in a dry form that can be reconstituted where and when required on the battlefield. There is no question that the requirements of World War II increase the urgency of developing the cone fractionation. From an academic point of view, there was really no purpose in the cone fractionation, but it was immensely important for transfusion technology. Essentially what it is, is using salt and solvents to fractionate proteins that have different solubilities. Before then, it was simply a matter of volume. You could not get enough protein into an individual to be therapeutically useful because you had to put in all the plasma. Here you just put in a small portion. Central to the success of the technique is Armour Pharmaceutical, who industrializes Cone's science and becomes the major supplier of albumin to the American military during World War II. Along with Beringwerker in Germany and ZLB in Switzerland, they helped to create a worldwide plasma products industry post-war. Fifty years later, all three organizations will integrate into the CSL network. But in the meantime, there's an industry to build. Albumin is just one of 2,000 plasma proteins, many of which have potential medical uses. As Cohn's technology is refined, the ability to separate these proteins improves, enabling expanding portfolios of life-saving and life-changing products. To develop these therapies, there's a need for an ample, healthy supply of human plasma. And from the early 1950s, CSL relies on the Red Cross for collection in Australia. Funded by the government, this system delivers treatment to patients free of charge. It isn't long before Christmas 1952 when CSL releases the first of their plasma products, an immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulins comprises the antibody proteins present in plasma. These antibodies are usually administered to provide temporary passive protection to persons exposed to certain diseases. As the science, production expertise and delivery systems evolve, more proteins are purified and many rare inherited diseases become treatable. Immunoglobulin was available uh, at the time albumin was, I guess, first discovered, but it wasn't in a form where you could give large volumes to people intravenously. And so it was tended to be given intramuscularly, which was quite painful. 1979, we introduced into the global markets the first intravenous immunoglobulin. And that meant that very large volumes of immunoglobulin could then be given to patients. And so people who are born with poor immune systems, largely they don't make antibodies or immunoglobulin, they could then be topped up on a regular basis. I was diagnosed with common variable immune deficiency and that is one of 200 diseases under the umbrella of primary immune deficiency. Now, primary immune deficiency is already rare, but when you break that out into 200 diseases, then it really becomes rare. 
The next group of plasma protein fractions is the coagulants. And these come in three principal concentrates for the treatment of coagulation deficiencies. Coagulation factors control the bleeding, if you like, in our bodies. And some kids, unfortunately, are born with deficiencies in these products. Factor eight and factor nine are two common ones. In Germany, Beringworker leads the world in development and production of coagulant products to treat life-threatening diseases such as haemophilia. This site here had a leadership position in developing plasma fractionation, purification, separation of proteins, describing certain proteins for the first time and turning them into commercial products. Beringwerger also pioneers the use of pasteurization to kill blood-borne viruses, which will prove invaluable in the fight against an emerging threat. In 1981, America becomes the first country to officially recognize an alarming new disease. In those days, it was called the gay-related infectious disease, or GRID. And we thought that it was a, a kind of a medical curiosity, but within a year or so, it was clear that this was going to be something that would transform all of our lives. By 1983, extreme fear surrounds the disease, now known as HIV AIDS, when it's discovered that the transmissible agent is primarily spread by blood. The numbers of people infected were doubling every few weeks or so, and there was a genuine fear by many people that we would truly have a pandemic and that everybody was at risk. Among those who are at significant risk are patients using plasma products. The entire industry is under intense scrutiny. CSL experiments with heat treatment during fractionation. The approach proves effective at inactivating the virus, helping to stabilize the crisis and protect patients. The HIV AIDS epidemic has a significant influence on the government's decision to invest in a new state-of-the-art fractionation plant at CSL's site in Broadmeadows. Broadmeadows was a way to go from being backward to state-of-the-art. CSL commits to the use of chromatography technology instead of cone fractionation. Implementation of this technology is great for people like me to do in the laboratory. It is a totally different thing to implement this in the factory. While chromatography has been around since the 1970s, it has never been successfully developed on an industrial scale. Other companies have tried and failed, so the decision carries a significant risk. We were totally committed and we had to make it work. We knew we'd done it in pilot scale, so we knew we'd do it again. The first three batches failed and uh, it was um, quite a tense period. Essentially, the product, Albumin, cleaned the new pipes, the stainless steel pipes, better than all the cleaning solutions that we used at the time. And so we were getting iron contamination. Thankfully, that disappeared by the fourth batch. The reward for all this risk is extraordinarily pure product and an enormous production capacity. Mastering the technology also arms the team with knowledge, skills and confidence to drive CSL's global expansion, helping to transform the much larger businesses they begin to acquire. ZLB, based in Switzerland, is one of the largest producers of plasma products in the world best known for its immunoglobulins. NABI, based in the US, is a nationwide network of plasma collection centers. And Aventus Bering, comprising the former Bering worker in Germany and Armour in the US, is an industry leader in coagulants and commercialization. In each new facility, CSL's innovations optimize efficiency, and the results are clear. Underperforming operations begin to thrive, and today, this globally integrated network generates 90% of CSL's revenues. Much of this commercial success is due to the launch of new products Privigen and Hyzentra, liquid immunoglobulins able to be stored at room temperature. Privigen is conceived in the labs of Bern 
and draws on the chromatography technology in Broadmeadows. It's executed as one of the first major collaborations after CSL's acquisition. In CSL's history, it was the first product to reach one billion US dollar of sales in one year. We also saw that intravenous application always needs the patients to go to the doctor, to stay in an ambulatory setting. And we thought, can't we do something for these patients? So that was the moment when uh, the uh, subcutaneous Hyzentra actually was born. I'm now actually on a product called uh, Hyzentra. I do my own treatment at home. I do four needles in my stomach, and it takes me about three hours. That's, a, that's an, just a little bit of an inconvenience compared to what it was when I started because the IVs were like nine hours. The source plasma that CSL Plasma collects here in the United States is used by all of the CSL bearing fractionation facilities across the globe. Six and a half thousand staff collect plasma from a growing network of donors in the US and Germany. Many of them, more than you might think, actually have a personal connection. They know somebody that uses the drugs that we manufacture. There's a pretty good percentage of our employees that are also donors. I had been working with my husband for 20 years in our own firm when the recession hit. I took a contract position at CSL. It was thriving in a time where our company was just dead. A manager had, had approached me and I said, you know, geez, I, I don't know anything about plasma. I don't know anything about the medical field. And uh, he said to me, Ty, if you really want to learn the business, go donate. First time I went to the center um, and I sat in the parking lot for a half an hour and left. So I went back, my husband came with me. It became easier to donate, and uh, I try to donate twice a week. It's been about three years now. I am on one of the drugs that your company produces, and it is a lifesaver for me. That I represent Each one of our centers in the U.S. is connected with a patient who takes our drugs so that they really get firsthand knowledge of what kinds of conditions people have that might require these pharmaceuticals. I told my husband, gosh, I only had pneumonia once this year. Can you believe that? I mean, there's constant improvement in my life I can see from year to year. Recombinant DNA technology represents a new era for the protein products industry. The acquisition of Aventus Bearing brings with it exciting science in recombinant coagulation factors, and the purchase of Zenith Therapeutics two years later deepens the capabilities and talent of CSL's global R&D team. As a company who manufactures plasma-derived product, um, it was basically the logical next step of the evolution. So the recombinant technology allows you to uh, generate improved molecules with new properties and which clearly can benefit the patients. So for example, with our most recent product, Idelvion, we've modified that protein so that it has an extended half-life. What that means is that patients who have been, say, treating themselves uh, prophylactically by injecting maybe two or three times a week can, moving forward, uh, treat themselves probably once every two weeks. Our clear plan and intention is to license, for the first time, both our Factor Nine and our Factor Eight recombinant products in the US and Europe and of course, other important parts of the world. You know, we had great history in vaccines, and then you had the plasma business. But now, all of a sudden, we've got a third leg that we can stand on. And Idelvion and Astilla, and hopefully after that, Factor 7, are really showing the world that CSL is the organisation that has the talent to do that. Plasma protein products are now the breadwinners for CSL, filling the void left by the mass public health products of the 20th century and fueling the transition from government-owned domestic manufacturer to a thriving global pioneer. Merely recounting the milestones can make this path to success seem obvious or even inevitable. But the reinvention of the organization required a bold vision, courage, and the determination to overcome resistance to change. How it did so 
is quite a tale.